Ladies and gentlemen, this Red Gaming Tentacom video, we're going to be discussing and analysing the GCN cores which make up the heart of the PlayStation 4 and, well, most like the Xbox 720 as well, of course, as the Southern Islands, also known as the Radeon 7000 series. And discussing uh, what they mean, how they benefit us as users, and just why AMD consider these to be the future of computing. So GCN, also known as Graphics Core Next Technology, if you prefer, is a new architecture that AMD have recently introduced. And the purpose of this is a an amalgamation and a future on computing. Beforehand, if we were to look at previous generations of graphics cards, and I'm going to probably release a separate video which is going to heavily go into the history of graphics cards and how they've changed over a number of years. Previous generations of graphics cards have began to slowly evolve from the days of just being able to play, say, Half-Life 2 at pretty resolutions and start to become workhorses, um, with rendering capabilities, with the ability to perform many complicated compute functionalities and being able to assist the CPU itself. After all, the more powerful a CPU becomes, the more it seems to rely on this functionality to really make the most out of things because CPUs, as I mentioned in my APU video, cannot do all things. It's just impossible. Now, AMD themselves are expecting and anticipating a world where CPUs and GPUs are pretty much on the same die. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't expect dedicated solutions to be available, for example, their own Radeon range, but what it does mean is they expect cores and graphics systems to be more integral and more tied into the CPU so that the CPU isn't always free to do tasks that it just can't do so well. If we were to look at previous generation of designs, you would notice that AMD were using a design that was has been around for a while now. And that would be a very long instruction word 5. Now, a very long instruction word 5 is very much like the later cores in that it very much relies on parallel computing, but there are a number of differences. Let's very quickly talk about the VLIW5. Now, VLIW5 was then changed to 4, and there are a couple of reasons for this. Mostly, it comes down to efficiency. So, let's very quickly talk about how the cores were put together back in the day, and then we'll talk about modern ones. Now, the SPUs in the device would be a given 4 or 5, depending on the design, as I've said, the word length, if you prefer, um, a fundamental math unit. By the way, AMD now calls these Radeon cores, and these can execute individual instructions in parallel, that's important, over as many clocks as necessary to finish the function. In other words, the function must be completed, and then it will move on. Okay, simple. That isn't strictly the only things that were there. There was also things such as registrars, branch units, and various other bits and pieces. But let's focus on this for the moment. Now, the design itself is designed, obviously, to execute as many operations at the same time in parallel. And it does this by breaking them down into groups. AMD would call these uh, groups wavefronts, indeed others would as well, but their version of the wavefront would be 64 pixel values and a list of instructions to be executed against them. In other words, what they had to actually be done to them. After all, you can't execute anything, you can't perform any instructions unless you know what those instructions are. Simple. Now, the problem thus becomes efficiency. There are what is known as dependent or non-interdependent files, uh, sorry, uh, instructions. Now, if an instruction was to come down as completely non-interdependent, it would allow each of the GCN calls to work and be fed with data. On the other hand, if a dependent instruction was to be issued, however, fewer instructions could be scheduled simultaneously. Indeed, in worst case scenarios, it's possible that only a single instruction could be scheduled on the CPU on, on the SPUs. 
Now, back in the days, well before AMD bought out ATI, um, they actually created, ATI created this design for the R300, or if you prefer, the Radeon 9700 series, so that would be the Radeon 9700, also known as one of the best graphics cards you could have possibly bought back in the day. It was a very revolutionary card, by the way, in terms of performance, and... It would use this because of the way the card was put together. In other words, the the dot product and a scalar component, that would be, for example, say, lightning. Lighting, I'm sorry, not lightning. At the same time. And at the time, there were very common operations for the graphics card to be required to perform. Now, later on, it, there was a move to unified shaders. And... AMD, or ATI, still kept the original VLIW5 design because gaming was still using the technology that was required for these operations, so that's fine. However, later on, by the, you know, the 6000 series, also known as Cayman launch, AMD did some internal research, and its research was showing that only 3.4 out of the 5 radial cores was being used. So, it shrank the word to 4. So, that helped, but utilization still wasn't nowhere near as good as it could have been. Now, there were a number of issues from this. Firstly... As we expect graphics cards to start becoming more and more other than just being able to produce pretty graphics on screen, we also, of course, expect them to be able to accelerate our creative processing, our videos, and everything else. What starts to happen is that the instruction sets that they expect to be given are becoming a lot bigger, and therefore it becomes a lot harder for this to become efficiently, efficiently compiled and scheduled. Um, there's another problem as well, and that is the compiler itself. And compiling usually is problems with language support. And you could have, say, issues where the compiler is producing intermediate code that can't really be handled that well. And finally, there's the fun of optimizations. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever programmed anything or you've ever seen code. Even for websites, it's pretty bad. But when you start to get into this level of complexity of code, it becomes a nightmare to start to debug things. And the VLIW makes it even harder to disassemble and debug. And therefore, it's much harder to get predictable performance. So, it's not just a case of a raw horsepower. It's not. It's, it also has to become efficiency, rendering efficiency, code efficiency. Um, quite simply put, if there's errors that keep cropping up because you as a developer don't have the sufficient resources or knowledge or just the time to be able to even figure what the hell is causing this issue, there are going to be bugs on launch. It's, it's just that simple. Games, of course, are becoming a lot more complicated now, but they are not by means least the the biggest issue uh, you know they they have their own problems but we're talking mostly upon professional level applications or just applications that require compute power or graphics card compute power or if you prefer general purpose and computing on uh, general processing units graphics processing units i'm sorry i'll say that one more time but general purpose computing on graphics processing units or gp gpu if you prefer so goodbye was said to that and hello was said to single instruction multi-data now this is where things became a lot better now I'm not going to go into the exact process of how these work because, to be honest with you, it would be an extremely dry and boring video. And some stuff is better explained in visual medium, so I'll probably write an article on that in the not too distant future. But do know that the GCN systems are also much better at 64 calculations as well. Um, 64 single precision multiply add. You've got four SIMDs times one ALO operation uh, is much better as well. You've got no register port conflicts too. Um, standardized compiler scheduling and optimization, simplified assembly creation, analysis and debug, as well as tool chain development support. But the most important one that they are emphasizing is stable and predictable performance. 
and it's also being introduced to level 2 cash and that by the way is significantly faster and more power efficient than using off chip graphics memory bear in mind however of course it's a lot smaller than you know off chip graphics memory and yes, that does of course include the PlayStation 4 before I get any comments. The PlayStation 4's memory bandwidth, bear in mind, despite the fact that it's pretty, uh, pretty high, it's 176 gigabytes per second, but once again, if you compare that to, you know, the 200 gigabytes plus of most of the graphics cards on uh, PCs in the 7000 range, the higher end 7000 range, it's just not that much at all, so, you know, it's just worth bearing in mind. Now they've also introduced uh, what is known as virtual memory and that is done through hardware and driver support. Now I'm not 100% if the PlayStation 4 supports this as well as Xbox 720 of course but it's most likely it does in some way or another. Now the whole purpose of this is to make it a hell of a lot easier for the CPU and the GPU to share memory. Indeed, in the official white paper that I'm reading, it actually says, and I quote, it paves the way for single address space that is seamlessly shared by the CPUs and GPUs. Sharing rather than copying the data is vital for performance and power efficiency and the critical element of um, in systems such as AMD's accelerated processing units, and that was the APUs that I was talking about earlier, which of course the um, it makes up the heart of the PS4. Now, the 4GC, or should I say, 4 compute units share a single 32KB level 1 cache, and that's 4-way associative, and that's backed up by the level 2 cache, by the way, as well. Now, for those of you who care, it's also worth noting that the GCN architecture heavily um, supports PCI Express 3 for interfacing and it does that of course between the CPU and the GPU. Now if you were to look at that, that's a 16 speed link and that's about 32 gigabytes per second of a bandwidth which is pretty darn high. Now all of this points to one thing, much better integration of the ability for, of the processor, the graphics processor, should I say, to be able to help and improve graphics technology. Now, as NVIDIA pointed out, and probably with some glee might I add, the CPU of the PS4 is not anything really to write home about. The Jaguar, the CPU side of things, is a core and of course contains, um, oh sorry, runs at 1.6 gigahertz. But in terms of actual power, it's not up to the standard of, say, a high-end desktop PC. It's just not. It can't physically run as many calculations per second, no matter how many cores it has. However, even the GPU is not specifically that powerful either, if you compare it to, once again, a PC. But the purpose of this is control and purpose of this of course is to provide a much better environment a much more conducive environment to create excellent looking games the memory bandwidth for the playstation 4 as i've mentioned before is around 176 gigabytes per second that unified memory combined with the much more efficient this all combines to perform or create a very powerful console and one that is capable of not just playing games for example it the GCN cores themselves are very very good at video encoding indeed the GCN cores themselves integrate a power efficient video codec engine also known as VCE and that contains full hardware implementation of the H 0.264 encoding that's actually 1080p and 60 fps which of course is very integral as well so what you're looking at is a complete redesign of how graphics cards and a complete 180 if you well maybe not 180 but a complete rethinking of the core ideas amd themselves are betting heavily on computing they're really pushing their future onto computing uh, with heavy compute future if you prefer 
rather than just graphics, they know that sure gamers are still going to want to be there. And of course, Microsoft or Sony or Nintendo, whomever, are going to want their technology as well. But they also know that games are not the only you know, reason to go with their stuff. They also know that creative professionals, um, coders and everyone else is going to want it as well. And it's all about power efficiency. Power efficiency is becoming increasingly important in the industry. And quite simply put, the more efficient you are, the more that you can integrate your technology, the better that te technology can be uh, used and easier it can be coded for, the better. As I said earlier, the whole purpose of the PlayStation 4, and one of the reasons, no doubt, that Sony have gone with this technology is the fact that, quite simply put, it's a lot easier and a lot easier to debug. If you remember one of my criticisms of the PlayStation 3, it's that it was a nightmare to program for for many developers. And as it turns out, very much as a prelude to things to come. The cell had to be recruited for the graphics card um, to do certain functionality. Now it's the reverse. Now it's a, a, a happy marriage of both GPU and CPU functionality with a ridiculous amount of bandwidth. Another example would be the implementation of the GCN allow now for you to implement underlying features necessary to support, say, C++, as well as other advanced languages. And as I've mentioned before, we also have much better FP64 support, which is very good indeed. Rather than really needing to push the OpenCL that we've previously needed, well, developers, shall I say, have previously needed to heavily rely upon. Now we're starting to see Microsoft C++, which, of course, is um, accelerated massive parallelism. parallelism. There's going to be a number of differences from the previous generation. However, power itself, in other words, how fast the down things are, is not that much ahead. I mean, sure, there is definitely a difference from the, the 6000 series or the previous generation of video cards, but this generation is definitely all about an improvement over the functionality, over the efficiency, over the power. It's, power usage um, which of course is very important for consoles themselves it's all about integration and improvements over you know the life for programmers and you know the the various instructions available in other words it's, it's a very good cornerstone as well of things to come it's a great prelude for things to come so speaking of things to come um this video has been fairly short at least by my standards i was going to make it a lot more technical in other words, you know, really going into the the, the nitty gritty of like how the word lamps work and so on. But what I found was it was really getting off point. So I'm probably going to release another video that's going to go into how graphics cards work, and I'm probably going to do it as a series because I think it will be, I figure it will be a lot better, and I figure it will uh, not shortchange anyone, and you know that way people can watch what they want to watch, and it'll be a lot better. So, I think that's just about it for this particular video. We are getting very close to the 1 million views as well. So, I'm very happy about that. So, thank you all for the support. Anyway, I'm pretty tired. So, I'm going to relax and record some Tomb Raider for you guys. And hopefully not die too much. So, take care and bye for now.